Listeners, I don't need to turn anything on, right? We're on. You're stuck. Automatically. Yes. Uh, good evening. <laughs> Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Planning Commission. Today's date is April 6, 2016, Wednesday. The time is 5.05. .05. Roll call, please. Planning Commissioners Astorian. Here. Bandrigan. Here. Manukian. Here. Chabazian. Here. And Chairperson Lee. Here. And can I have a report regarding posting of agenda? Um, yes, the report for this meeting was posted on Wednesday, March 30th, 2016, on the bulletin board outside City Hall and on the city's website. Thank you. I'm going to ask Commissioner Sebastian to lead us in pledge. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Thank you. Okay, if you had an opportunity to look at minutes, can I get a motion? So move. Okay, we'll have a motion. Second. 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 Okay, motion and second. So the minutes from the last meeting was is approved. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have to say that my approval is up to 5.30 last time. Thank you for the uh, <laughs> clarification. So with that noted. Um, and oral communication, uh, we do have folks in the audience which I've uh, taken a liberty to invite uh, these people here. Uh, I met them, uh, uh, you know, outside, uh, and then they had very interesting um, item, which was, which is the uh, automated parking system. Uh, I don't think uh, City of Glendale has um, automated parking system yet, so I thought it'd be something. Uh, it'll be nice for all our commissioners to have opportunity to uh, to hear the presentation uh, from them. So, uh, can can I invite um, people from Auto Park It uh, Company? Do they have a card? Yeah, they do. Mr. Chair, thanks for Please stay inviting joining. us. Yeah. Uh, commission members, thanks for having us. My name is Christopher Allen. I'm president of Auto Park It. Uh, we have a short video, if you don't mind uh, indulging us, which will give you a pretty good perspective on what we do. This particular project was the um, pilot project for automated parking for the city of Los Angeles. Uh, Bud Overham, at the time, who was uh, head of building and safety, signed the permit himself. We worked through the mayor's office to write new codes and develop an automated parking standard for the city of Los Angeles. Uh, so we'll go ahead and show the video and then we'll continue. Thanks. Hit play. We don't have speakers. Oh, well, it's kind of the, the brightness of the light is probably going to diminish it. All right, we'll just kind of walk through as it's going. So, this is a this is an apartment building on Burbank Boulevard in Sherman Oaks, and it's a fully automated parking system. Now, the property itself, the building itself, is only 33 feet wide. So you can imagine the small parcels of property or the diminished footprint in urban areas like Glendale where you're trying to fit more density uh, to, to adhere to different planning goals, et cetera, for walkable cities. You can't park it. <clears throat> so in this particular project here, we show what you can do on such a small piece of property to underscore the opportunity that's created with automated parking. So this particular project has eight units. By right, you could build eight units. However, if we would have parked it with traditional parking, we would have only been able to do four units because we would have only been able to provide surface parking. 
As an example, the parking that is below grade in this particular project, which is 10 spaces, you wouldn't have been able to do one space per code with traditional parking because by the time you ramped down, had a drive aisle width, it would have taken up the entire footprint. And instead, we've parked 10 cars below and then we have three levels of parking up above to accommodate the full 18 units and guests. <coughs> so effectively, if you, can, if you have a piece of property and you can park 100 cars, I can park 200. So if you have a footprint that doesn't allow you to park 200 cars and you need 200 cars, or you have a footprint um, that you need more cars than what you can park, either way we can accommodate that. Now we park volumetrically as well. So we're not just diminishing because we don't need drive aisles, we don't need column width for turning in and out. We're also parking volumetrically. We're measuring the cars whenever they come in the load bay. So as an example, we're doing a Ferrari dealership where four levels of the system, the, the clear space is only five feet tall because the cars are only four feet tall. So you don't need the space. So where you have height restrictions, which in planning we always have height restrictions uh, for the most part, where you have height restrictions, we can take and accommodate parking because we're going to fit three levels of automated parking within two levels of traditional parking. Um, there are a number of other advantages with automated parking. So when you go to the environmental side, as an example, the cars are not running through the system. So all of the fumes that would normally be um, uh, uh, extruded from the car, right, uh, the exhaust and the gasoline that would be used, all of that goes away because the cars aren't running. You pull into a one-and-a-half one car garage, and you leave the car, and then the car is taken and conveyed through the system and parked. So if we had an automated parking system here, as an example, when you would leave this room, you would actually wave your ticket, scan your ticket, wave your key fob. It would send a signal to the parking system that you're coming to get your car, and it would go ahead and retrieve your car while you're walking over to the parking <coughs> system to diminish your queue time. Instead of having to walk over there, take an elevator up or down, go and walk and find your car, drive down through, wait for someone to pull out, Etc. your car would be delivered to you. So the other advantage of it is it's non-occupied space. So the system itself doesn't have anyone in it. So there are different building codes, different fire codes, etc., with non-occupied space, which makes it better for the, the opportunity for a developer and from a building standpoint. Because of that, and because you have nobody in it, and there are no fumes, you don't have the required mechanical ventilation because you're not taking the fumes from these cars and then pumping it into the surrounding community because there are no fumes. So the mechanical ventilation required for a traditional parking structure, you don't need for automated parking. So you don't have the cost of the mechanical ventilation, you don't have the maintenance required for maintaining that system, and you don't have the energy consumption for mechanical ventilation on an annual basis. So there are huge savings from a uh, sustainability standpoint. Same goes with the lighting. There's nobody in the system, so the, the foot candles that you need are for maintenance only. So when the system um, doesn't have maintenance being performed on it, there are no lights on in the system. So the infrastructure that goes along with that, the cost of maintaining that infrastructure, and the energy consumption with running those lights 24 hours a day, seven days a week for years and years and years, all goes away. Diminishes the overall cost of uh, running the system, which whenever you compare apples to apples is about 40% less for an auto park it system versus a traditional parking system. And we can give you analysis on, on backup information for everything that we're talking about today if you want to look into it further. Um, but it, it creates the only opportunity for environmentally friendly green parking. Additionally, in an auto park it system, we use structural steel. So the concrete floors that you see with traditional parking, that goes away. We don't need all the concrete. You know, making cement is the least friendly um, product of the construction industry that, that there is because of the amount of energy that it consumes to actually make cement. We don't, need, we don't need that. We have concrete for our foundations, that's it. We're structural steel up. So it's completely recyclable material. Additionally, it's a bolt-together system. So ostensibly, if you wanted to build it here and then 15 years from now you wanted to move it, we could take it down and rebuild it. Or we can add on to it. 
you can build it in phases. So you can put a section in here, and we can design it so that you could extend that later on whenever you um, needed a larger system. We also do automated storage, self-storage. So you look at self-storage uh, and developers who do self-storage. When you build apartment buildings, you guys are building a lot of apartments, condos, things like that in downtown Glendale. What's the first thing that someone who moves into an apartment, they, they go and they rent off-site storage because uh, they have too much stuff to fit in that condo or that apartment. And so you end up with these areas where you have great development and then a piece of land that was assembled that becomes uh, garages, in effect. We can take and do automated storage in the system itself. So you build 200 parking spaces, you only need 180. You can do 20 units in the system itself, or we can do an offsite and make it look like the rest of the, the um, architectural environment that you have around there. You're in a historical district, and um, typically in a traditional parking structure, it's going to be a large concrete structure that they try to keep as open as possible because they want to diminish the amount of mechanical ventilation that you have. Um, but it has to be concrete and pretty much open air. So you're always trying to hide the parking structure for the most part because it's the least attractive part of a development or of a city streetscape. Well, with us, since the cars aren't running, there's no required ventilation, et cetera, we can make it look like every other building along the city block. You can make it look like a historical building if you're in a historical district. You can, you know, veneer it in glass if you want to. You can, you can do anything because you don't have all of the ventilation requirements that you do with traditional parking. And so you can improve the streetscape. So it's better from a planning, from an aesthetic point of view of, of creating a look, site plan review, architectural review. It gives you more opportunities with automated parking, as well as, again, the environmental benefit. And from a planning standpoint, uh, you don't have to, when you're looking at mass transit, et cetera, people have to drive at some point to get to the mass transit. We can take those footprints and we can diminish them. We can put more density. We can make it more attractive, safer, secure. Auto parking systems um, are safer than a traditional parking system. 42% of sexual assaults that happen outside of a family member happen in parking structures, not in auto park it, parking structures. 18% of insurance claims for damage to your car because you left your purse or your wallet or your iPhone. Someone broke the window and stole it. Or someone like my mom, who's not really good at pulling in tight spaces, hit your car when she pulled in. Or when she backed out, she scraped the concrete column, damaged her car. All of that goes away in an auto park it system because you're not parking the car or conveying the car on a pallet. So there are a lot of benefits, especially from a planning standpoint. Uh, it gives you more opportunity from a planning standpoint for your uh, small parcels of property, larger, larger parcels of property, uh, creates better opportunities for ingress and egress and queuing. Um, there are huge benefits to automated parking for cities to start looking at planning <coughs> with automated parking. C City of San Francisco recently passed legislation mandating a requirement for automated parking in new developments. <coughs> Um, the city of Los Angeles has a number of projects. We have over 30 projects in the city of L.A. that are um, actively being built, have been built, or in design and starting construction. Uh, we're building across the country now in a half a dozen different states, and you're going to see a huge growth in automated parking as it becomes um, more and more prevalent. And we would encourage you to uh, take a hard look at it. We think it's a, it's a good tool for you to use while planning the city of Glendale, and especially with the growth that you guys have enjoyed and the opportunities that that growth can create. And uh, we've worked with a number of cities, working, continue to work with municipalities now and helping them um, write codes and both on the planning and building side for automated parking and would be happy to uh, help in any way that we can to facilitate that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Um, uh, this is oral communication, so there's no decision that needs to be made, but we could ask some questions if you have any questions. Uh, I do have a question, actually. Curious to know, um, can you go underground, then, or can you go above two stories on the structures? So the answer is yes. It's steel structure, mm -hmm. so you can go as high as you want. Any steel structure, okay. you know, whatever's feasible for a steel structure, you can go. And subterranean, uh, most of the projects that you have in 
urban environments in, uh, in the West are subterranean. So probably 50% of the projects that we have in LA right now are subterranean projects. One of the huge benefits with using auto park it in a subterranean environment is uh, one of the big challenges is getting the dirt in and out and shoring the walls and the tiebacks, et cetera, from holding that wall in place before you put the concrete. You know, you have travel routes that you have to go, haul routes that you have to take the dirt to. And um, taking the dirt more, you know, it seems to be further and further and further, increases the cost. Uh, you have water table issues, et cetera. Since we're parking volumetrically, you might take what would be traditionally a 45-foot excavation, and we would cut it to 22. So the length of construction is diminished. The, the number of trucks required to haul that dirt away are diminished. The amount of time the <clears throat> construction equipment is running and the exhaust from that is diminished. So you have great air quality benefits, et cetera, as well as less disruption to traffic, less disruption to uh, adjacent businesses, uh, faster construction schedule, et cetera. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Very interesting. Um, the length of queue and ingress and egress, what is the, well, I'm sure it depends on the structure and how many cars you have, but um, so there would, in our parking requirements, we have a certain width for ingress and egress for uh, cars to come and go. I only saw one is, do you go in the same garage? Oh, you want to pull up one of the other projects that you have down there? So. The, the, the reason that you saw the one on there is that's a site that's 33 feet wide. And we did that property specifically to show what you could do, the advantages on a site that, that wasn't possible to do anything. Um, the design of the system is based on the property that you have. So if you're the largest system we're working on is 5,600 cars. It has 42 load bays. Mm -hmm. So at any given time in that system, we're moving 142 cars at the same time between shuttles, lifts, load bays, et cetera. So you're going to design the footprint or uh, design the system based on the footprint and what your peak hour demand is, what your requirement, your traffic requirement is. So mm -hmm. you're going to give us a traffic study as an example. The developer mm -hmm. is going to give us a traffic study. Department of Transportation is going to give us requirements for queuing. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to design a system that accommodates that. So we're not going to try to put a square peg into a round hole. We're going to go with the typical standards of, of uh, Department of Transportation and planning to make sure that we design a system that is appropriate and performs as designed. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in essence, if I just may finish that, at 8 o'clock, or let's say 7 o'clock, because half of the people have to go someplace by 8 o'clock, you have almost everybody in the building wanting out. It's queued up. Do you know when your queue comes up? Can you brush your teeth until you get like a five minute alarm and you go down there? I mean, how automated is it? So it depends on how you design the system. The, an the answer to those questions is yes. Uh, you, you have a queue and it tells you where you are in the queue. But because it's intelligent parking, you can do things uh, a little bit differently. Let's say that it's a, an executive office building and you have penthouse office that goes for more money. Those people can be put into a priority queue, as an example, or penthouse condos or um, commission members, right? Could be put <laughs> I knew in the you front, were going to go there could somehow be front, or another. Put in the front of I was the hoping queue. you were going to say senators. Right. But. <laughs> <laughs> Council people, we'll go with that. Council people. They can be put in the front of the queue. As an example, uh, you, you can, any technology that, that is available out right now, your iPhone app, uh, fobs, tickets, mm -hmm. uh, any way you want to do it. Let's say that um, you were going to do a governmental building for uh, the U.S. government and you wanted to be able to sniff for, for bomb residue in the load base, we can do that. We can deploy that technology. So all of the opportunities that are out there in security in uh, technology are available to be integrated into the system itself. Thank you. It's actually very simple. We're doing first grade math compared to um, uh, astrophysics. I mean, we are really just using the basic, basic automated storage retrieval principles for commercial application in parking, uh, automobiles, doing automated self-storage, and boats, marinas storage. 
So let me ask you a couple of questions. Uh, what's your average call time on, on the project that you have in Burbank? 33 cars, is that what it is? So, uh, no. So the project that we showed you, which was a pilot program for automated parking for the city of Los Angeles, 18 cars. The project we're completing at Helms Bakery right now, uh, which Culver City is, is using um, as well because it's partially in Culver City, is 247 cars. The way that we design our systems is typically 40 to 180 seconds for retrieval. Okay? Now, that's in a linear process. So if you walked out to the system and you scanned your fob, 40 to 180 seconds, depending on where it is in the system coming back. But we don't want to run it in a linear fashion. We want you to do early retrieval. So when you leave your office, you're on the 10th floor or adjacent like it like you are here in this particular building, you would go ahead and queue your car. So it would be retrieved and put in a queuing spot so that once you get to the system, you're not in a load bay holding up someone else's car, but you're in an adjacent spot so that at that point, it's only a 12 to 15 second drop to get your car. Yeah. And uh, you, you, we have a pretty good idea of what a subterranean garage per spot or per car mm -hmm. costs. Any ideas of what per How much is your stop? cost, do you think? Well. You don't want to ask that. Mine is a whole lot lower than what you would think. But generally speaking, because I, I build subterranean parking structures, generally as well. speaking, is between twenty-five to thirty-two thousand dollars. Now that's on the first level, and you go down, it's a little it's bit more expensive. expensive. Right. So, what's the cost of per stall on something like this? So, typically, our efficiency started between two hundred and two hundred and fifty cars. So, on an above-grade structure of 250 cars plus, we're going to be in the 20 to 21, 22 thousand dollar range, no. which is which is competitive with traditional parking. Um, when you go below grade, typically we're going to be cheaper than uh, subterranean parking because we're going to diminish the amount of excavation, the thickness of the walls because we're retaining less soil, uh, you're shoring, et cetera. So whenever you go below grade, depending on when you're going one level, two level, three levels, we're typically going to be somewhere between $25,000 and $35,000, including your concrete work. Because you remember, we're not doing concrete floors, so that cost is removed. We're not going as deep, so the amount of shoring, the length of shoring, et cetera, is going to be diminished. So. Typically, when you get into subterranean parking, there are, there are not a lot of structures going up anymore that are only one level, unless they're small apartment buildings, in which case they're going to park 40 or 50 cars, and we're probably not going to be your solution for that unless it's a small footprint anyways. Um, but when you get to larger systems and you go subterranean, they're going to be significantly more than that. I think uh, Walker Parking just provided the latest in Los Angeles where subterranean parking um, for... I forget if it's two levels and beyond, starts at about 40 grand a stall. And we're typically going to be somewhere, when you get down to two levels like that, somewhere between 28 and 35,000 a stall. So we're, we're going to be less than traditional subterranean concrete parking uh, once you get to any kind of size, 250 stalls or above. Just one more. I'm curious. Where did you get the 42% rape uh, uh, statistics on the parking lot? So that's a um, insurance um, uh, analysis that was done that shows where um, crimes are committed with regard to parking. It was a study that was done. We're happy to provide that for you. I'd like to see that. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. It was very informative. So do you have a question? Okay. So I, I have yeah. one quick question. Yes. So if you had been parking UCLA's parking lot when the flood came, the damage to your system from flooding, what is the probability of that? Because if you're underground, that's always an issue. How protected is it? Um, a non-automated parking system would not be affected because there's nothing except for the mechanical to affect. Well, see, but here's the, here's the difference. The difference with that particular project was uh, the reason that it flooded was because it came in down the ramp. Because of the requirement to get the cars in and out, you could only go so high with the ramp, et cetera. And so that's why it ended up flooding. Whereas with us, we don't have the ramps. So you could have set the height for ingress and egress if, if flooding was potentially going to be an issue. You can set the level because we're going to go down with a lift. We're not going to go ramp down. So we're not concerned about the height from the curb, as an example. But 
in our pits, we're going to put pumps. Now, if you have a four, I, I think that was like a four foot main or something that broke in the street that <laughs> well, flooded that particular inch, car, yeah. uh, uh, car parking lot. Um, if you have something like that and it's going to flood the building, it's going to flood the building whether we have sump pumps in the right. bottom or not, which we do. Um, but typically, the only thing that you would have in uh, below grade in the pit is going to be uh, your motors for it because everything else is up in the electrical room is going to be your motors and those are interchangeable so it's just a matter of replacing the motors everything's structural steel so thank you very much Mr. Allen mm -hmm. let uh, me ask one more question no. <laughs> uh, your Burbank project mm -hmm. um, how many car parking is that so that one's 18 Helms Bakery is 247. And, and the reason that they chose that system, the uh, uh, your system, is because they did they they were could have, tight with the with, with with the space or what was they could it? have only parked well it's only 33 feet wide by 102 feet deep. Traditionally, you could have only parked eight cars, which means you could have only built four units. Okay. So uh, they were able to build eight units, which is a hundred percent increase in density. So that's not a subterranean. Uh, it is. It's one it level. Is. One level subterranean. One level sub and, and, and levels, it's three levels above grade. Okay. Yeah. So it's both, and that was one of the reasons it was it, the the particular site was chosen, was to illustrate the opportunity to go above grade and below grade, but at the same time take something that was impossible to park. And what was the cost of it. that in Burbank? Thirty-one grand to stall, including the concrete. thirty-one thousand. Yeah, including concrete. And it has one. Uh, you couldn't have done that in concrete, by the way. Yeah, but but it has one uh, one entry, right? Uh, one, yeah, just uh, one single. It's only eighteen cars. Okay. Yeah. And what's what's the queue time for that, Mr. Chairman? Uh, it's the same. Me? The the system there is designed for forty to one hundred and twenty seconds. Yep. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, obviously, uh, there's a great interest as I had great interest in this when I was introduced to this concept. So. You know, I'd like to uh, sometime, uh, you know, ask our staff to maybe uh, coordinate a meeting with them to maybe uh, have another uh, meeting uh, scheduled uh, to enlighten our uh, planning staff. Um, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So, because obviously it gives us uh, uh, many options uh, with this system. So. Uh, I'd like to do a further study, um, so if you can uh, set that up for future uh, Okay, yeah, we can, we can do that. Yeah, yeah thank you. <clears throat> so moving on, uh, item number six, uh, zoning appeals, we don't have any. Uh, item number seven, uh, planning commission items, uh, old business, there is none. New, new business, we have... Code Amendment Case Number PZC 1605184. So can we have um, Ms. Asp give us a presentation? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the Commission. Um, Tonight we are here to um, talk about uh, landscape standards and artificial turf specifically. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, this is a topic that um, we have been looking at for, for many years now. Uh, started back in 2008, 2009, there was um, the first zoning code revision that allowed artificial turf, uh, and basically it is, it's actually the rules that we currently have still today, which is uh, really only in the R1 uh, single family zoning designation, kind of the flatland, uh, and really only in the backyard when you couldn't see it from, from the public right of way. Uh, we were asked to revisit the topic again, um, and in 2011, we suggested some uh, revisions, um, but no changes were made at that time uh, as well. Um, however, in May of last year, Council did initiate changes to specifically talk about drought-tolerant landscaping and artificial turf standards. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, we hired a consultant, uh, Rescape, to study artificial turf uh, and drought-tolerant landscaping, uh, compare the benefits, things like that. Um, However, subsequently, in October of 2015, uh, the governor signed AB 1164, uh, which basically bars cities from banning artificial turf on residential properties. 
Um, so so the, the work we had the consultant do to make a comparison between artificial turf and drought tolerant made it a little moot, but, um, but their, their study was useful for, um, for suggesting standards um, for, uh, for artificial turf. Council asked um, that this discussion be brought back to them. Uh, we brought that back uh, at the end of last year in October and again in December, um, where they provided staff direction, and that is uh, the ordinance that is before you tonight. Just to give you a little recap of what our current rules are regarding um, the current regulations for uh, landscaping uh, in single family zones. 40% of the total lot area must be landscaped. Uh, this includes decorative elements such as pools um, or rocks or mulch. Um, half of that 40%, uh, 50, uh, half of that must be live plant material. Uh, the same thing goes for um, all street setback areas. So this is the street front and street side setback area must be fully landscaped. And of that area, 50% must contain live plants. In our other zones, our multifamily zones, um, only 25 to 30% of the lot area has to be landscaped. Commercial and industrial zones uh, is really not uh, applicable. Um, there's some small minor setbacks in the C1 and C2 zones uh, that could be landscaped. Our mixed use zones uh, only require 10% of the lot area. So um, some changes uh, related to drought tolerant landscapes uh, that are presented uh, tonight. It, we are maintaining the 50% live plant material requirement. Um, that, that's not changing. Uh, what is changing is the calculation of the plants. Um, uh, currently, our policy is 50% is of the live plant material has to cover that area at the time that it's installed. Um, there was a, a lot of discussion about, OK, some, you know, some drought tolerant um, uh, landscapes look really good when they start out, the plants are a little smaller, and it takes a little while, a little while for them to grow in, and they kind of get to that 50%. So, so the, the consensus was to calculate the coverage of, of drought-tolerant plants at their full maturity or at full growth. However, counter to that, um, we are, we are going to be um, a different when calculating uh, tree canopies. Uh, specifically, we're going to count tree canopies at the time of planting. And I think the rationale behind that was you install a, like a five gallon tree, and if you're really assuming at, at full maturity, that could be a, a decade or so before, before you get some, some coverage there. So, so that's the difference between tree canopies uh, and, and other plants. And while this isn't really um, sort of associated with drought tolerant landscapings, uh, uh, landscapes, we are putting a prohibition of um, painting turf or dirt. Uh, I think there are some uh, practices where, where some companies will go around and spray paint your uh, brown lawn green. Um, we are, there was consensus to prohibit that. So, Landscapes <coughs> with artificial turf, uh, specifically in residential zones. So this is going to cover our single family zones and our multifamily <coughs> zones. Uh, again, we are maintaining the 50% live plant material requirement. Um, and we are not considering artificial turf to be that live plant material. So half of it has to be alive. The rest of it can be considered uh, for artificial turf. We are going to require a three-foot wide live plant material uh, landscape border. Um, this is going to be required at the base of a building facing a street front or a street side, and also at the street front and street side property lines. Um, Originally, we had kind of considered this for aesthetic reasons, um, but also found that we think it'll assist in uh, runoff um, or any potential runoff. There was some council discussion about requiring additional borders at interior property lines and along the driveways. Um, just to maybe offer some flexibility, I think we, st we stuck with the, the, at the, at the base of a, of a building and at the property line. Um, again, just to offer flexibility, but did add that artificial turf um, is required to drain to a pervious area. By no means does this mean um, that somebody couldn't put in a wider border. It doesn't mean that they couldn't put in more borders along the driveway or along uh, interior property lines. This is just sort of um, establishing the minimums. And this is really just for illustrative purposes. Um, illustrative purposes. This is a driveway. 
the blue box is, is the, the single family residence um, or multifamily residence. Um, a three foot live planting border at the base and at the property line. Um, the, uh, the area in between is, is available for artificial turf. Um, uh, this obviously looks a little bit more than 50%. It's just sort of pointing out this is where artificial turf can go, but there's still the 50% uh, uh, limit. This would be a similar example just on a corner lot of how it wraps, um, wraps the building and the property line at the street and street side. So uh, how we permit that, we also have some um, prohibitions. So artificial turf will be pro prohibited beneath the drip line of trees, um, and we are defining that as the extent of a tree canopy at mature growth plus two feet. So this is really to um, protect existing trees um, and uh, encourage people when they are putting in artificial turf and considering it, that they have to take into consideration um, any trees, any new trees that they plant, that they, they leave room for, for growth. Um, artificial turf will be prohibited in all parking lot landscaping. When a landscape buffer is required next to residential zones, on any sloped areas greater than 25%, uh, and in all industrial and commercial zones. We are going to allow artificial turf in our mixed use zones, uh, but only when not visible from the public right of way. Uh, so the characteristics uh, and installation, what we want to see uh, when it goes in. We are saying that artificial turf shall imitate a natural turf-like appearance. It is not intended to create a mini football field or baseball diamond or um, advertise your, your favorite um, football team or logos, things like that. <laughs> um, so we're, it has to imitate a natural turf-like appearance. So a three-color blend minimum, mainly green. Uh, we're requiring a one-and-a-half minimum blade length with spines, which helps the blade stand up, um, and uneven tops, again, to kind of mimic that natural turf-like appearance. Uh, infill is often used in artificial turf, uh, and we are requiring only natural infill, so things like sand, uh, cork, coconut fiber, no crumb rubber will be permitted. And uh, installation uh, will be required to be done by a qualified state licensed contractor. Um, at the moment, um, qualified uh, state contractors would be those with a landscaping contractor's license and a synthetic products uh, license from the state. There, there is no permit uh, generally for landscaping unless um, there is some irrigation valves done. So this is really um, going to be sort of the honor system up to the property owner to use a qualified um, contractor. Now, for those that may have installed artificial turf um, prior to these rules going into place, um, if, there is, if, if there can be proven that installation was done before December 8th of 2015, uh, and I will make a note that um, the ordinance does say 2016, but it is December 8th, 2015, okay. um, the, the installation may remain if the three-foot wide landscape borders are installed if there is no artificial turf located beneath uh, the drip line of trees um, and it does not exceed the 50 percent uh, of the street setback areas. If, if all those criteria are met, the blade length, the number of colors, and the infill, infill material will not have to comply with these, these new uh, suggested standards. So that kind of covers um, how we have outlined um, standards for artificial turf in the code. Um, uh, staff asks that the Planning Commission uh, recommend approval of these changes, and we will move it forward to City Council for introduction and adoption. I'm available if there are any questions. Mr. Chair. Yes. Did you uh, say that no crump rubber would be allowed? Correct. Because that's what they use for underlayment nowadays, at least that's my understanding. That's what they use as, as pardon? For the, for the artificial, for AT. Crumb, uh, cr uh, there, are, they use, there are a number of materials that can be used. They can like, use aggregate, they can use a concrete board, but the crumb rubber has been used as filler to bring 
life to the blade. So it's a filler between the blades. It's never been used as an underlay. As the underneath part. So that the artificial turf is sort of laid out like a like carpet, right. let's say. And that's the last piece is putting in the, the infill, putting in the sand, putting in the crumb rubber, and it would sink down to the to the base of the carpet layer. But we're not gonna allow that. We're not gonna allow crumb rubber. Okay. Any other questions for the staff? I have a question. Um, the three color blend, blend where it says mainly green, mm -hmm. uh, what does that suggest? That they could blend in different colors with the green, but let's say more than 50% has to be green? They can blend, um, some of the, the samples that we've seen, the, the three colors are two shades of green and then maybe more of a brown uh, brown color just to kind of give some variation of, you know, most natural lawns aren't you know, solid 100% green. There is some some yellow flecks, some um, some brown uh, uh, blades in there that that give it some variety. And they would have to come to you for approval before they install. <laughs> so let's say if they are blending in some some color that wouldn't, like a neon color, just for um, example, you, it would be disapproved. It would not the be reason approved. Reason why I'm saying is because they could interpret this as as let's say 50% or more green and the rest of it, they could choose a different color to, to play with. So I want to make sure that that's clear um, so the user understands that they can't go in. Well, I think that the way the language is written is that it's to mimic a, a natural turf-like appearance, so that would that would sort of count out the neon okay. pink or the neon blue. Um, but just to be clear, there there is no permit for this. So this is an, you know, kind of the installed by a licensed contractor, okay. you know, what are the rules um, and, and following them. On the, from the property owner's perspective. Okay, but it is going to be reviewed by um, when they're submitting, or so they're just going to review this and they're going to have a, um, a licensed landscape architect, let's say, plant this for them, or- License, the, licensed contractor. Contractor, I'm sorry. Install. Install it for them, and that's it. No involvement with the city, with the planning department. Um, unless there's a problem, unless there is a complaint. So, any other questions? Yes. So just to follow up, may I suggest that uh, in any any um, instruction that you write out, uh, the three-color blend minimum, comma, mainly green, comma, in order to closely mimic natural grass. Because if you're not going to give permits, you're not going to do inspection. If you're not going to do inspection, some so I will may end up doing... I guess I'll start with page two, if number six. Artificial turf shall imitate a natural turf-like appearance and require the following. A minimum blend of three colors, okay, predominantly green. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Any more questions? Yes, Commissioner Landry. Ms. Asp, um, I'm sure everybody here knows that I have had concerns about this, uh, and I did bring them to council. And many of those concerns were the health benefits, the heat island effect, the stormwater um, uh, issues that are raised with artificial turf. And I have to say that I thought the report and those concerns are very well addressed in the solution here, and I um, want to commend Rescape and and PlaceWorks and the city for hiring them because I think their study really substantiated some of those concerns and also responded so that art artificial turf can be used, but it also can be used in a very responsible manner. And especially the the crumb rubber has been. Um, implicated in a lot of cancers and others, although uh, they're kind of cluster studies, and, um, and I'm so happy that the alternatives have been specifically called out here. And uh, I do think that this is um, a good ordinance and a good compromise, and I, I want to thank everybody who was involved in it, and I would say that I have no problem supporting sending it to the council as probably the most vocal opponent here. 
Sounds like we already turned into discussion. So you want to make a motion? Make a motion. <laughs> Certainly. I move that the project is categorically exempt from CEQA as a Class 5 minor alteration in land use limitations as described in the staff report dated April 6th. 2016, and that upon consideration of the proposed ordinance relating generally to landscape standards involving artificial turf at a public hearing, the Planning Commission hereby recommends that the City Council adopt the proposed amendments to the Title 30 of the Glendale Municipal Code, 1995. Second. If, was that date corrected on this? Oh, uh, with or the correction with of the, correction the, of the December... Date? The December 8th, 2015, not 16 date. With the correction of the date being December 8th, 2015, not 2016. Thank you. So we have motion and a support. Roll call. Uh, discussion, yeah. please. Yes. Yeah. Oh, correct, Certainly. please. <laughs> yeah, so, so I don't want to be you know, too quick to extol the virtues of, of, of artificial turf, but I will tell you, I mean, when you, when you look at soil health, biodiversity, Greenhouse emissions. Uh, yeah, these are the heat island effects. I mean, I was just making it. I mean, and, and emission of zinc, lead, cadmium, VOC. all of those. I mean, uh, I, I, in my opinion, I, I don't have an issue with drought tolerant uh, plants, but I do have an issue with artificial turf. With that, I just wanted to share my views. Thank you. Any more discussion? We do have motion and support. Roll call, please. Planning Commissioners Astorian? No. Landrigan? Yes. Banukian? Yes. Trapazian? Yes. Jefferson Lee? Yes. So with the vote of 401, um, the motion for the Code Amendment case number PZC 1605184 passes. So number eight, Community Development Department updates. Um, there are no updates. Uh, <laughs> there are no updates for this. Do, do we have department. scheduled meeting for uh, first week of May? Uh, second week, I think there are no problems. For, uh, for, for May, second week yes. In April. So we have 19th to go. Don't oh, we? I'm April, sorry. Uh, 20th. The 20th? 20th. Um, yeah. I am not positive. But yes, on May 4th. <laughs> okay, the, the, the reason I'm asking is that. Um, May 4th, yes. May 4th, yes, okay. So we'll have to make the arrangement because I'll be out of the country during that time. So I guess it'll be... I'll take over the gavel for you. Yes, there you go. <laughs> so you won't be here for Cinco de Mayo? Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> I'm, I'm devastated. <laughs> okay, um, comments from commissioners? <clears throat> Thank I'll entertain a German. Okay, so moved. Thank you. Thank you.